equanimity can actually be, be manifested or practiced at actually four different levels. Yeah? Four different levels. Okay? I think of particular interest to us will be the first two levels. Okay? That's also because I don't think I've reached the third level, neither obviously not the fourth level. Okay? The first level is when we are able to associate or when we are able to apply equanimity in dealing with what we call vicissitudes in life. I think all of you are familiar with the topic of eight worldly conditions, right? So the antidote for the eight worldly conditions is actually the equanimity. All right? uh, the eight worldly conditions, as all of you know, which later I'll just touch. So I'll just give you an overall view. Yeah? So the eight worldly conditions, everybody is affected by the eight worldly conditions. Even the Buddha, even the Arahans, they are affected by the eight worldly conditions. But the difference is uh, we, we get caught up in the eight worldly conditions, whereas the enlightened beings, right, like the Arahans, maybe the Buddhas, they are not affected by that. So it is what we call a mind that is unshaken. In the Loka Vipati Sutta, some of you are familiar, in the, in the Book of Eight, the Buddha says, All, everybody is affected. And uh, the only differential factor why the enlightened beings or the arahants or the Buddhas, they are not affected because they have the practice of equanimity. So that's one level. Okay? Maybe our equanimity is not the level of the Buddhas and arahants. But that's not, uh, there's no reason for us to worry because there are different levels we can practice. Yeah? So first thing is we need to understand the, at that level. The second level is when uh, when, when we realize that equanimity is important because it has got something to do with our relationship with others. If you notice the four Brahma Viharas, a lot of it has got to do with how we deal with society, isn't it? How we deal with people. Loving kindness, all right? Of course, we say loving kindness for oneself, but it's also loving kindness for others. And then compassion and sympathetic joy. When dealing with others, all right? When things don't go the way that we want it to go, uh, equanimity helps a lot. Okay? So that's at the second level, which are very important for all of us. Okay? The third level is, of course, as a factor of enlightenment. I think you're aware of uh, the seven factors of enlightenment. And from concentration, the concentration leads on to equanimity. And you know, you also read that in the fourth jhanas, you know, we talk about equanimity as the fourth jhanas. Right? So again, as I said, there's something to be practiced. If you are already at the level of third and fourth jhanas, then, then you don't need to, then you know exactly what it is. And I will not be qualified to talk to you. All right? And of course, the fourth level is at the level of the Buddhas, who practice, the, for example, the paramis, the perfections, the ten perfections. All right? So in some Buddhist traditions, the ideal is to be a Buddha. Right? Like in the Mahayana tradition, in the Tibetan tradition, the ideal is to become a Buddha. So that is why they emphasize a lot on the paramitas. Of course, in, that, in those tra traditions, it is called the six paramitas. But actually, it's ten paramitas and expansion of the six paramitas. So that's give you an overview of how, equan how important equanimity is in the entire Buddhist tradition. Okay? So with that, I'll just uh, take you through some of some slides here. And then to show that there are actually four manifestations of four different levels that we can practice uh, equanimity. And towards the end, we will see how would be some of the, uh, you can say, uh, the, some practices that we could, we could uh, apply uh, in our everyday life in the practice of equanimity. Okay? I, I think to understand this, we need to go back again. What is the purpose? Why are we here? <laughs> I think we always need to ask that question, why are we here, and the importance of uh, uh, practicing or studying the, the, the Dhamma. All right? Essentially, you can, you can see the slides, right? So I'll look at my PC here. So essentially, we're, we're talking about there are, again, three levels of, uh, of, of happiness that uh, the Buddha says that uh, his entire teachings is about how to help us to overcome suffering so that we can find happiness in life. But here, the Buddha is talking about three different levels of happiness. So we're talking about happiness here and now through ethical living, like through following the precepts, 
and harmonious relationships like practicing the Brahma Viharas, practicing compassion, practicing loving kindness, empathetic joy, equanimity. So all these are very important. The Buddha never denied that. All right? in, in, so you got the Pali word there. So happiness here and now, which are very important for us. Likewise, happiness in future life, when we practice generosity, we observe precepts, and also we cultivate the mind. So whatever good things that we do in this life itself will be translated, will be carried forward to our next life. All right? So if you understand the, how the law of karma works, then you understand why this is the case. All right? Because the law of karma essentially says that all actions have consequences. So what kind of actions has what kind of consequences? So if you understand the law of karma, it says wholesome actions or good actions have got wholesome consequences. Consequences means results. Okay? So we understand that. So our future lives is actually dependent on what we do now. Not so much what we did in the past. Because whatever you did in the past is quite beyond, isn't it? It's quite beyond you now. You can't do anything. What the past has already passed. What is important is the present, because the present will determine the future. That's why, again, if you understand the law of karma, it becomes so very important that our everyday life has to be based on uh, an understanding of karma. This has to be one that is ethical in nature. Okay? And of course, we talk about ultimate happiness, because you talk about future lives. Future lives, again, in the final analysis, is not permanent, isn't it? Is subject to change. It's still in what we call samsara. Samsara means we are born, we die, we are reborn, we die. So it's continuous. It doesn't ch change. It doesn't end. So ultimately, that is why the Buddha talks about ultimate happiness. And, and the path that the Buddha has given us is the Eightfold Path. Yeah? So in an Eightfold Path, you find that it has got eight components. So you cannot just choose one component and say, I only practice that. You, you, you can't, otherwise the Buddha would have called it the Eightfold Path. So some people thought that only, only if I practice uh, maybe meditation, then that is the solution. Of course, that is very important, but that's not the, 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 the full spectrum of it, because you still have got sila, isn't it? which is the ethical conduct. All right? so, and you've got right views, which later we will come to. Because you may be a great meditator in the sense that you've got deep concentration, false jhanas, all right? but you don't have the right views. So uh, uh, again, you don't uh, achieve that ultimate happiness. Prince Siddhartha Gautama, remember, before he became the, the, the Buddha, he attained to very, very high states of jhanas. But he realized that it helps only in concentration, but he doesn't, uh, that's not the, the, the final one. Okay? So ultimately, we need to have right views about things. So that's also linked to equanimity. So when we practice equanimity, so we always have to, to remember how it is linked to why we are actually in the first place practicing the Dharma. All right? For happiness, not just in this life. Happiness, again, not just for next life. But ultimately, so that we can have the ultimate happiness. All right? Or like you mentioned early on, Nibbanic bliss. Okay? And we do that when we uh, follow the Eightfold Path. Okay, so I think that's the purpose. So I think it's very important each time when we listen to a Dhamma talk that for us to know why we are here, the purpose we are here. Because if we do not know the purpose, then we are just blindly listening and then uh, that's not the best way. Okay? Now, just a quick few definitions. I think before anything, we need to understand what the word Upeka actually means. Different uh, teachers may have given you different definition. So I've, given, I've got this definition from Bhikkhu Bodhi, who is a, a well-known Buddhist translator. I think he has translated uh, uh, many of the Pali texts. Some of you may have heard of Bhikkhu Bodhi. So he says the real meaning of Upeka is equanimity, yeah? not indifference. So indifference will be like a, a near enemy of equanimity. I'm sure when you... Uh, when you had the other sessions, or whoever the speakers uh, who spoke on Mudita, maybe Brother Siang Chai, you know, and, and the earlier speakers, they would have, have told you that they are also near enemies and far enemies, right? So for each one of it, they have. So in this case, it is uh, indifference in the sense of unconcern for others. So it is said that if you look at the Buddha, 
he was very engaged, isn't it? How long was the Buddha engaged? 45 years. Did 45 years the Buddha did nothing and just sit under the tree <laughs> the, and, and, and meditate? No, he actually walked the length and breadth of India. Of course, legends say he even flew to Burma, he even flew to Sri Lanka. <laughs> of course, that's legends. But that is just to depict that how dynamic the Buddha was, even though he was in a state of equanimity. All right? So equanimity does not mean uh, an unconcern for others. All right? Some of you know about the late Venerable Thich Nhat Hanh, isn't it? Now, he was a very f well-known uh, Zen master, and, um, and he always talks about engaged Buddhism. All right? All right? Engaged bu Buddhism. So, it is a spiritual virtue, Upeka means stability in the face of the fluctuations of worldly fortune. It is evenness of mind, unshakable freedom of mind, a state of inner equipoise that cannot be upset by, which I call the eight worldly conditions. Okay? So this is one definition from Bhikkhu Bodhi. All right? Upeka is freedom from all points of self-reference, indifferent to, only to the demands of the ego self. It's only indifferent to the ego. All right? with its craving for pleasure and position, not to the well-being of one's fellow human beings. All right? So you have that line there, for the, for, the, for the benefit of the many and happiness of the many. All right? So if you have that always in your mind, it is still imbued with equanimity. All right? It is said that, like for example, you have gone through the four Brahma Viharas, without equanimity, it is very difficult to actually practice compassion or love or sympathetic joy. Um, that is why in the Tibetan tradition, they actually start with equanimity as the practice. For example, so have you heard of bodhicitta training, isn't it? bodhicitta, where you treat all sentient beings as your mother. Uh, so that's one of the, the first training that the, in the Tibetan tradition, right? so they would use. But it just to show the importance of it, whether it's the beginning or the end, it doesn't really matter. Right? It's there. Okay? So, um, yeah, so the four, you see, so Bhikkhu Bodhi also talk, talks about true equanimity is the pinnacle of the four social attitudes. So these four Brahma Viharas, they are also known as social attitudes or mental attitudes. You know, like mental and social because from mental it's translated into action. Right? Like Su Chi, for example, isn't it? The whole philosophy of Su Chi, of course, is based on compassion. But it's just not compassion sitting down uh, radiating, radiating love and compassion to everybody when there's a disaster or when there's a tsunami, but they actually go into action to put, trans, to put compassion into action. All right? So that's an uh, example of uh, when mental attitudes became a social attitude, become social action. All right? And this is loving kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity. So the last, which is equanimity, does not override and negate the preceding three, but perfects and consummates them. Right, so I think this is a very good, very good explanation. I think this is good enough than whatever else that I'm going to say. <laughs> so I think this sums it up. Now, the other definition which I thought is also good from uh, U Pandita, who, has, who, who passed away a couple of years ago, one of these, uh, these, the, what do you call it, the successors of the late Mahasi, uh, Mahasi Sayadaw, right? You know that, okay? Now, in his book called In This Very Life, this is what Upandita has got to say about equanimity. So again, it clarifies. One might worry that reflections on non-attachment and equanimity could turn into unfeeling indifference and lead us to abandon a mate or a dear person. All right? This is not the case. Equanimity is not insensitivity or indifference or apathy. The mind rests in an attitude of balance and acceptance of things as they are. So when you're able to see things as they are, you have that love, you have that compassion. So it's not indifference. It's, it's not saying, oh, I'm fed up with the world, you know, there's too much suffering, you know, so I don't want to be involved in the world. So that's not equanimity. <laughs> that's in a way more like running away from, from the facts of life. Right? If that's the way, as I said, the Buddha wouldn't have stayed back 45 years to, to teach the Dhamma. Why does he teach the Dhamma? It's for the benefit of all of us. All right? So that's the very reason why the Buddha stayed back, out of equanimity. So with these two definitions, I, I just refresh your memory, all right, the four levels that I talked to you about. So you can look at equanimity in terms of four levels of practice. 
I'm not sure what level you are, all right? I'm still very much trying to, level, to practice level one, okay? So if you're level four, that's wonderful, that's great, or, or level five maybe. But these are important, all right? All of us, we, we need to, to understand the importance of uh, how equanimity. So the, they're called eight vicissitudes of life. Uh, the, the, the main discourse that the Buddha talks about this is called the Loka Vipati Sutta. Loka Vipati. Loka means the world. Loka, right? Loka Vipati Sutta. You can find it in a book of eight, right? The, so there the Buddha talks about what are these eight. So we know that this is an authentic Buddhist teachings because it is found in the suttas, right? In the early discourses. And of course, four sublime states, which you have all uh, been, ex been, 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 been explained. There are also specific suttas. There is also the Brahma Vihara Sutta. All right, so you can make reference to that. And of course, meditative stabilization. This will be talking about jhanas. So again, as I said, uh, uh, I'm definitely not qualified to talk to you about fourth jhanas or even third jhanas. All right? But we need to understand what these are. Because as we practice, because this has got to do with wisdom in a short while I will show. And finally, the ten perfections. So let's, let's go through what are these eight. Uh, this is, uh, so, so the Buddha told, told his bhikkhus, these eight worldly conditions spin after the world. And the world spins after these eight worldly conditions. So what are these eight? All right, gain and loss, fame and ill fame, praise and blame, happiness and sorrow. All right. So I, again, these are not new topics. I think all of you are already familiar, so I'm not going to delve into that. Instead, I'm just going to pose some questions so that you, all of us would go back, including myself, to constantly remind myself that when I face with uh, this eight vicissity of life, do I, uh, am I able to, for example, uh, uh, apply equanimity in it? Okay? So let's look at some of these questions that I think is good for us to reflect. All right? Remember, the Buddha says one of the very important is investigation, isn't it? Investigation of, of Dhamma, no? Dhamma Vichaya, right? So, so let's, let's in investigate. Let's look at gain and loss, all right? Is gain always positive? Is loss always negative? All right? So I'm not going to give you answers to all this, but it's something for us to, to think about it. So I'm sure I I in your lives, there will be occasions where you thought it was a loss, but actually it turned out to be a gain eventually. Isn't it? And there are a lot of stories about that. Okay? Wasn't it true that what we thought at the time was a gain was actually a loss and vice versa? So you look at your life, look at the, your experiences. Are there such occasions? In my life, <laughs> I've gone through so many of it. In, initially, I thought it was a great loss. I was very sad, you know, very disappointed. But three days later, I realized, hey, actually, it was a blessing in disguise. You know? So what does that tell us? That tells us that all these vicissitudes in life, they are subject to change. They are impermanent, isn't it? They are flux. They are, in there, they are fluid. Right? So they are always in a state of flux. So they are always subject to, to change. Right? Is attaching to gain, is there always the fear of loss? You gain something. You are very happy, very excited about it. But before that excitement can even be sustained, you are already worried. Will I lose it? <laughs> Will I lose that? Okay. Um, in attaching to success, is there also the fear of failure? All right. Our society is so driven by success that uh, we are so worried about failure. All right. So I so I am particularly very, uh, very, uh, shall I say, it, heartened when when I understand that one of my my groups or, com or company philosophy is, is actually is to celebrate uh, what we call forward-making mistakes. You know, we have an ex expression called forward-making mistakes. In other words, if you make a mistake, don't worry, that's not the end of your life. If you make a mistake, which is a loss, right? Isn't it? You make a mistake, do you learn from that mistake? If you learn from that mistake, it is called a forward-looking mistake. So we celebrate that because you make a mistake, maybe from, from, from the business point of view, maybe the company loses uh, 5 million ringgit, 5 million dollars, but you can look at it as an investment in, in, in you learning from this mistake. All right? and, and there are actually stories, uh, I remember many years ago, uh, Jack Welch, you know Jack Welch, some of you have heard of Jack Welch, GE, 
Of, of course, GE is no longer the, the, the darling of the industry today. Fortune 500 no longer think highly of GE, but many, many years ago, GE was, was kind of the, the IBMs of those days. So GE, in, uh, Jack Welch, for example, he had a, a, a manager who lost a few million dollars in Eastern Europe. So the manager was called up to, to headquarters and the manager thought, look, he's going to get a boot. He's going to lose his job. All right, so he had a, a, a meeting with Jack Welch and after meeting Jack Welch, Jack Welch says, okay, that's it. That, I want to talk to you. So he, he left the room and just as he was about to close the, 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 the room, <laughs> He couldn't control his, uh, his, 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 his suspense, so he opened the door again and he said, Jack, he says, um, are you not going to sack me? Jack said, should I sack you? I've just in, I just in invested 50 million, I just f invested 50 million dollars in you. That means I invested in you as my managing director in Eastern Europe and you have lost it. So if you learn from it, from that discussion, looks like you have learned from it. And, and there are valuable lessons. So if I sack you, I lose. So I've invested in you in that sense. So if you look at things in that manner, all right, then you will not be so terribly up, upset. So not everything must be couched in, in black and white. So there are always shades of grey in life. All right? And I'm sure all of you have your own ex experience in that. Yeah? So these are some examples. If we cling to models of success, we set ourselves up for disappointment. Okay? Gain and loss are a natural part of the flux of life. Master Singing has got a wonderful saying here from his book called Humble Table, Wise Fair, which is a translation from Chinese. He said, life with suffering and happiness is full, complete. Life with success and failure is reasonable. <laughs> you have success, you have failure, it's reasonable. Life with gain and loss is fair. Right? Um, those of you who invest in the stock market, right? I'm sure you make money sometimes, you lose money sometimes. Can you always make money? You, 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 you can't, but I hope you don't always lose money. No. <laughs> right. So life with gain and loss is fair, and life with birth and death is natural. You are born, then you die. So uh, Bhante Akachita very cheekily he answered when somebody asked, what is the cause for death? He said, the cause for death is your birth. Because you're born, so you die. <laughs> That's the cause of death. All right? so, so you investigate it in a, in a, in a more, uh, shall I say, more metaphysical sense, then that's true. But Master Singin, I think he has written in four lines. You know? That's the beauty of some of these uh, Chinese Zen masters. Like Master Singin, he's both a pure land and a Zen. So, you know, so he's able to encapsulate some of these great teachings. Yeah? So fame and ill fame, I'll go through quickly. Do we need to be seen by others when we do something we think worthy? So you do something good. Do you always want to make sure that the cameras are ready, you know, <laughs> that the people are able to capture, you know, what you're doing, and then af after that, uh, you know, is your name going to appear in the newspapers? So what is a reaction to being misjudged, uh, which is the ill fame part, okay? What is our relationship to status? All right. Some people are so status conscious, isn't it? Um, I think Malaysia is one of those, like the British, uh, very status conscious compared to Singapore, where everybody is a Mr. and Miss, isn't it? Right? And you, you find when you, talk, when you look at the ministers, they all dress in, in short sleeve shirts, you know, but Malaysia is just a river. You know, and some people, if they are given titles, uh, they even get, off, get, get offended if you don't address them by the right title, isn't it? So that, that's the kind of. Uh, of uh, mentality that, uh, that people have. So we are, our relationship is status, okay? So being aware of our relationship to fame and, and disrepute allows us to be free from dependency on the opinions of others, okay? So again, these are just questions. As I said, uh, I don't intend to give you answers to it because you have your own answers, but fame and ill fame. So you ask yourself whether is it true that you experience this, okay? Praise and blame. When praise, are we aware of our reaction? When somebody praises us, right, do we get so engrossed in this and our reaction is, I want more. <laughs> Please praise more. <laughs> so are we aware of our reactions? Right? Do we crave for more? Right? When blame, do we justify our actions? Accept the blame or blame the person who blames us? 
That's our typical reaction, isn't it? You know, in the Brahma Jala Sutta, the first discourse of the long discourses, when somebody, when someone was praising the Buddha, and the Buddha asked the person, "How do you know that what he said is true?" <laughs> Likewise, another occasion when somebody was blaming. All right, I think that's uh, the the next one. Right. So likewise, you know, the, the Buddha told Atula, they blame those who are silent. This is a story in the Dhammapada. Uh, this Atula is a lay person, I think, with a few hundred disciples. So apparently he, 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 he went to, <coughs> to, to the, the first monk, I can't remember the name. He went to the first monk and, and the first monk kept very silent, just telling him to sit and meditate. He said, I come to you for teachings, but you just tell me to sit and meditate. You're not teaching me anything. Then he went to the, 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 the second monk, I think maybe Venerable Sariputta, who then gave a long exposition on Paticca Samupada, on dependent origination. He said, my gosh, that's too complicating. Why are you talking so, why are you telling me so many things? <laughs> so the Buddha told Atula, they blame those who are silent. They blame those who speak too much. Those speaking little too, they blame. Uh, no one avoids blame in, in, in this world. Even the Buddha himself was blamed, remember? But what is the difference? How the Buddha reacts? Okay, how the Buddha reacts? So there never was, there never will be, nor does there exist now anyone who is wholly blamed or wholly praised. You just cannot find someone of that nature. Just now I mentioned to you about Jack Welch, right? Those of you who are, who are in management, you must have heard of Jack Welch. 20 years ago, Jack Welch cannot do anything wrong. Whatever Jack Welch says, the world of management would want to follow. But last 10 years, when Jack Wells stepped down as the chairman of GE, and they look at GE, has lost market share, they even have to sell off many companies. People said, he's not the guy you should follow. So the fame and ill fame has all gone. All right? uh, Venerable Xing Yan, you know, before he passed away, or Fakusan, Dhamma Drum Mountain, before he passed away, I think two, three months, he actually wrote a biography he kind of knew that he was, he was, <laughs> he was passing away. And in his biography, if you, if you read, I think it's called Footprints in the, in the Snow, I think. Footprints in the Snow. And, 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 he, and he said, look, what is this fame and ill fame? He said, when I first went to America to teach the Dharma, I had to sleep in those cotton boxes. You know? Nobody knows who, 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 who I was. But to me, that doesn't really matter. Because my purpose is to teach the Dhamma, to share the Dhamma with the Americans. So he did that. I think it was in New York or Bronze, or that, that area. He was living in a cotton box, like those homeless. And he said, uh, but then when I came back to Taiwan, he's, he's from Taiwan, he said even the vice president you know, came to welcome me in motorcades. So that's fame. But eventually I will die. So after I'm dead and gone, after a while people will not even remember who I am. So that's the nature of reality. So when you're able to see perspectives in the broad sense, uh, then you say, okay, if there's fame, okay, I appreciate it. If there's no fame, then I see what, what is it that maybe I did not do right. All right, so we change, okay? So there are examples about this. Happiness and sorrow. Can we be aware of suffering inherent in the pursuit of pleasure and avoidance of pain? Can we experience pleasure with no clinging to it? Can we feel pain without trying to get rid of it? Sometimes we can e even have clinging to our, our calmness when we sit in meditation, isn't it? Some, some, you know, some people maybe they feel very calm when they are in, the, in meditation, but the moment they're out of meditation, they're very distressed. So they're always wanting to go back. So, it's, so if they're not careful, that is like clinging to, to that state of, of meditation, right? So, so again, that pleasant experience during our meditation experience, we just let it go. We know it arises, it will fall away. Whatever arises will just fall away. So we don't cling to it. If it is a, a, a moment of uh, calmness that we experience in our meditation, okay, we, let it, we will let it go at some stage. So understanding the changing nature of pleasure and pain that is beyond our control, can we not cling to it? So we should be open to pleasure and pain, yet not overwhelmed by desire or aversion. So you, you, you look at it, a lot of things, we are either clinging to uh, wanting more or wanting to reject. 
isn't it? That's the desire and aversion. Right? So happiness and, and sorrow, again, is something that we cannot uh, uh, run away from. Okay? But we also, the Buddha also gave us uh, a lot of examples how we can, we, we can react to it or we can respond to it. There's a, there's a discourse called the parable of the arrow. I'm sure you've heard of it, the parable of the arrow in the Salata Sutta. Salata, S-A-L-A-T-T-H-A. Salata means arrow. So in the Salata arrow, the, the, the Buddha says, you know, if it, like a person has been shot by the first arrow. When a person is shot by the first arrow, it's the physical pain, isn't it? Right? So that's, there's no denying it. It is painful, of course, you're shot by an arrow, first arrow. But most of the time, after being shot by the first arrow, we cling on to the second arrow. And what is the second arrow? The second arrow is our reaction. You know, we start thinking, oh, you know, who, you know the, the, in other words, the mental aspects of the pain that, that we have. So in that beautiful illustration in the Salata Sutta, uh, if you read that, you find that the Buddha explains how we should look at the, the suffering that we experience. Some suffering you cannot run away from. Birth, old age, sickness, how to run away from? You cannot run away from, from well, you are, you're already born, especially illness and sickness, Ill, uh, illness and old age, something that we cannot run away from. All right? How do we react to sickness? How do we react to our old age as we get older? Is the second arrow. Is what the Buddha meant by the second arrow. So the first arrow is the old age. The first arrow is the sickness that, that, that we get. The first arrow is the pandemic, right? is the COVID-19. Could you do anything about it? The whole world. You know that? Xi Jinping thought he was a hero. He thought that he could control. Could he do it? He can't either. <laughs> Isn't it? Right? He can't do that either. Look at what happens in Shanghai now. Right? So nobody can control certain things. But how we react to that is important. Okay? So equanimity then becomes another uh, wonderful tool for us to respond during such kind of difficulties. Right? So, uh, this is a very interesting story here. Is a, a student went to his master and said, my meditation is horrible. I feel distracted. My legs ache. You know, like, like we say, when you sit for too long, you get pins and needles in your legs, isn't it? <laughs> I'm constantly falling asleep. I'm just horrible. And the teacher replied, it will pass. Don't worry about it. And a week later, the student came back to his master. He said, look, my meditation is wonderful this week. I feel so aware, so peaceful, so alive, so wonderful. The master said, fantastic, you have done well. The master said, it will pass. <laughs> that too will not be there. It will pass as well. All right. So I think these are really wise uh, advice uh, for all of us uh, in our everyday life. So to take things in a very calm manner. All right. Good things come. We appreciate it. It doesn't mean that we push away the good things. Good things come, yeah, we appreciate it. But we also know that good things don't last forever. They don't last forever. So we always have that at the back of, of our mind. Okay? So the second one is the Brahma Vihara. So I'm not going to talk about the first tree because you have already been fully explained, I'm sure, about the first tree. So I'm going to go on straight to the fourth one. But um, you know, there's so many teachings on the Brahma Viharas. One of the, the most interesting ones which I found, I'm not sure if you have come across, is actually an, um, an images of the four Brahma Viharas, like the sun. This is from Bhikkhu Analayo. You know who is, is some of you have heard of Bhikkhu Analayo? Bhikkhu Analayo was a, well, he was a kind of a, a student of Bhikkhu Bodhi, and he is very well known for two things, I think. Um, on mindfulness, he, he writes about my, my mindfulness, right? And, and and also, he studies the Pali, uh, Pali Nikayas, and he compares it to the Chinese Agamas. These are the early Buddhist uh, texts, right? So, so if you are in, interested in that, the Bhikkhu Bodhi is, is uh, Bhikkhu Analayo is the person to contact. So just a quick one. Here, he, he, uh, Bhikkhu Analayo com compares the four Brahma Viharas, like the images of the sun. All right? He says, Metta, loving kindness, is like the sun at noon, very bright, shining, shining on everyone. All right? And then Karuna is a sun setting, <laughs> meeting the darkness of suffering with tender care. 
So the evening is also a wonderful time, isn't it? Right? But then, you know, it's like the sun setting. And mudita is like sunrise, brightening everything in its path, fresh and inspiring, maybe like spring, right? if, you are, if you are familiar with the, the, temp, the temperate world. And then, of course, upeka is of the full moon, reflecting the light of the sun in the vast, cloudless night sky. <laughs> so I thought this is a be beautiful illust illustration. So this is from his book called Compassion and Emptiness in Early Buddhist Meditation. Right? So you can, you can find these details if you are interested in this. So what Bhikkhu Analayo says about equanimity is that what's unique about equanimity is that it helps balance the other three aspects of love so that we don't burn out in our caring. So the first three are, are actually like, you know, has got to do with love, compassion, even joy. They are, they are kind of similar in, in that sense. So equanimity balances the other three aspects of love so that we don't burn out in our caring. All right? In expressing the other aspects of love to others. It keeps us grounded. I was talking to a, a Buddhist friend who re recently got very, very involved with the Suchi movement, even though he doesn't know Mandarin at all. <laughs> but uh, he was telling me that one of the things in fact, we were saying, what is it that makes the Suchi volunteers, I don't know, maybe some, some of you here are, you know, so dynamic in, in, uh, in able to, 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 you know, uh, to, to help those who are in, in, in difficult situations? He said, one of the things that they learn is to, be, to have an equanimous mind. Because if not, you get overwhelmed by the suffering that you see. Right? You, you'll be seeing so much suffering. So if you don't cultivate the equanimity, then it's going to be very, very challenging. All right, so this is what he shared with me. So it keeps us grounded. So we have like two feet on the ground. All right? Without equanimity, our compassion can become compassion fatigue. Right? You, 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 you become just exhausted. We can outpour to an extent that we become exhausted or overly identified with the situation. So equanimity helps us resource and in our, keep in our center, in our balance. All right? So it's a very interesting book here. It talks about compassion and emptiness. Uh, so, you notice that the trend is even uh, Bhikkhu Analayo, because of his, of his uh, deep insights into the, 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 what they call the early texts, the, the Agamas. So, he still looks into like emptiness, which is a very uh, Mahayana or Tibetan teaching, a sunyata. Right? Of course, it's also mentioned in the Pali teaching, but more so in the Mahayana. Right? Okay, so the, the next one, so as I say, I'm not going to talk too much about the other three, you have all been exposed. Now the other one is of course on the factors of, of enlightenment. So again, we will take us, uh, it take us seven sessions to talk about this. <laughs> so I'm just going to, to show you where equanimity fits in, in terms of the factors of enlightenment. So with concentration, concentra once with concentration is well guarded, is, is well developed, it leads to equanimity. Now why is that so? When the mind is well concentrated, what is it that we are able to overcome? The five hindrances, isn't it? Right? We have managed to overcome the five hindrances. So once the mind is free of the five hindrances, then you, you, you find that very naturally, it allows the mind to develop the wholesome qualities. Now, why is that so? Because in the Anapanasati Sutta, it says, he who sees with discernment the abandoning of greed and distress in ones who watches carefully with equanimity. Once the five hindrances, once we develop concentration, once we kind of uh, reduce the, 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 what they call the, the hindrances, the five hindrances, then you'll find that you abandon greed, you abandon distress or, or aversion. So then equanimity arises. So he carefully watches the mind thus concentrated with equanimity. And when he carefully watches the mind, thus concentrated with equanimity, equanimity as a factor for enlightenment becomes aroused. Right? So you can see that relationship there. Right? Relationship is so very important. That's why we talk about the importance of right concentration. Right? There's also wrong concentration. Right? <laughs> you're wrong. If you concentrate in a wrong way, then, you, you, then you're not going get, to get all these things. Yeah? Okay? So the, the last part here is about equanimity as, an, as a perfection, right? So as I mentioned, there are different manifestations, right? Depending on what level you are. Even if you have never 
really practice meditation, right? But you first time you heard about loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy, and you kind of you can still practice it in your, you know, everyday life. But here you find that there are ten perfections. So again, I will not go into each one of them, but just to show you that that linkage between uh, equanimity, how important it is in the context of perfections. And you know, perfections are the paramis or paramitas that one develops to become Buddhas, right? To become a Buddha. And uh, out of these ten, uh, two are actually of significant importance. In fact, they kind of help one another, right? To help what actually helps equanimity, right? Patience and equanimity are the mainstay for the other perfections, all right? Only when one has established these two can one expect to fulfill the rest. Just as a newborn infant can only survive with the care of its parents, the remaining eight perfections can only be fulfilled under the constant care of patience and equanimity. So patience may be likened to the mother and equanimity to the father. So this is what uh, uh, Lady Sayadaw, I think some of you who may be familiar with Lady Sayadaw, so you can find details. I, I always give you the sources so that you can always, you know, because there's so much that I can share with you during a, a 45 minute or 50 minutes. So I hope that you will, you will assess this called the, uh, it's called the Utama Purisa Dipani, Utama like the highest form. Yeah? So this is uh, way back in 1980, okay? So the last part is, I just like to, to share with you a, a little bit. So the first part is just to, to, to talk to you about the importance of equanimity in the Buddhist tradition, how important it is. You can find at different aspects, different levels of our, of our practice. Yeah? So, so that you do not have to feel intimidated that you, are, you don't have to attain any jhanas, but can you still practice that? Yeah, you can. For example, how we apply the, the, the equanimity in our eight vicissitudes in, in life. So how do we cultivate that? So how do we cultivate equanimity? Right? So there are a few examples here. Uh, one is wise reflection. In the Sabha Sava Sutta, the Buddha says, for one who reflects wisely, anxieties and troubles that have not yet arisen do not arise. And those that have already arisen, they fall away. So for those who does not reflect wisely, anxieties and troubles that have not yet arisen will arise. And those that have already arisen, they will increase. All right? So, Maybe another session, you could invite someone to speak to you about this particular sutta. How, 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 do, how do we actually cultivate wise, wise reflection, right? So there's, there's a lot of things there. Now, an example of this is, you know, wise reflection. So this is, uh, one day Achan Cha held up a beautiful Chinese tea cup. To me, this cup is already broken because I know it's fate. I can enjoy it fully here and now. And when it's gone, it's gone. When we understand the truth of uncertainty and relax, we become free. So it's something that we have to change our mindset. We have to look at things in a different perspective. All right? So this is the, the, the story of Achan Cha taking up, holding a Chinese cup. Right? And then he said, this cup is already broken. <laughs> because if you say that this cup is already broken, then when, it, when eventually it, it, it breaks, as one day it will, then you do not feel so terrible. Actually, I can relate this. I, I like this story because um, I, many, many years ago when I, when I first graduated, and, and you know how long ago that, that, that would be, right? Um, those days, um, you know, it's, it's, it's very cheap to go from Malaysia to, to, to Singapore through woodlands. And I remember those days when I just graduated from university, I, I bought a, a conning ware, you know, you know conning ware that, 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 and I think it cost me only like uh, maybe 25 ringgit. <laughs> and that was maybe 1980. And I use it and that I've been using it. It's been very precious. I got two of it, very precious of it. It has never fallen. It has never broken. But uh, six, seven months ago, when I just took it up to, to heat up some food, it just cracked. <laughs> it just cracked. So my immediate reaction was, oh my gosh, I only got two and I, you know, I've got such a sentimental value because I bought it when I was a 
just graduated from university, I went to Woodlands and I bought it at a time when the Malaysian ringgit was even better than the Singapore dollar. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Maybe some of you were, were too young to, to even know that, yeah? So yeah, those days, our ringgit was even slightly better than, than, the, than Malaysian, than the Sing dollar. But then, thanks to, you know, my, my remembering this story, I told myself, if I could just smile to myself and say, yeah, yeah, like what Chan Sa says, this, <laughs> this calling where is already broken. Yeah. So, so when that happens, then you, you, you don't get too emotionally distressed, so to speak. <laughs> okay, so I, I think that's a very important lesson for me, at, at least. But, um, so here he said, but when I know that the glass is already broken, every minute with it is precious. Isn't it? So this is where you find that he's very engaged. And he's such a wonderful character, isn't it? <laughs> a wonderful character. So what is it that makes someone like him, you know, such a wonderful character, all right? So I think it's the, all right, like what he says here, when the mind is agitated, you should realize this is not certain, it's impermanent. When the mind is calm, don't start thinking, ah, really peaceful, because that is also not certain. <laughs> so this is from his book, one of my favorite books called Everything Arises, Everything Falls Away. It reminds me of my first meditation practice, rising, falling, rising, falling. <laughs> Everything rises, it falls away. All right? Does that make us very negative? Does it make us very pessimistic? No. It actually makes us see the world in a very different perspective. When good things come to us, we appreciate it. And we appreciate every minute of it, like what Achan Cha says. Because you know, eventually this thing will pass away. So you appreciate every minute of it. You really value it, all right? And eventually when it goes, it goes, you know? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. so that's right view, okay? So I think right view is very, very important, okay? So when we come to study the Dharma, that is why in the Eightfold Path, it says Samaditi, isn't it? Right view, right understanding. So no matter how good your sila is, no matter how good your, uh, your meditation is, if you don't have right view, it doesn't complete our practice. Yeah, it doesn't complete our practice. Okay? And I, and I like this very uh, wonderful teaching from Shantideva in the Bodhichaya Vatara, where he says, if a problem can be solved, why worry? If the problem cannot be solved, Worrying will do you no good, <laughs> isn't it? It's a very, pow very powerful teaching, very powerful advice, something that for us to reflect again and again and again. In the Tibetan teachings, this is called uh, lojong, L-O-J-O-N-G. You can Google what that means, lojong. Lojong means mind training, mind training. So you always, constantly you tell your, you, you try to remember, it's like a mantra, you know? The mantra need not be some, some words that you don't understand. Mantra can be words that you understand. So this is one of the mantra that I always have in my work life. You know, work life, you feel a lot of problems in it. And not all problems can be solved. <laughs> I do my best to solve the problems. I'll tell my chairman, I say, look, I don't think this can be solved immediately. All right. So just three, three weeks ago, we were talking about diversity in Malaysia. I said, look, Diversity and inclusion is a very Western thing. It's good, but you cannot solve, you cannot implement that in Malaysia overnight. We can start, but you can't do it overnight. Okay, so that's my mantra. If a problem can be solved, why worry? If the problem cannot be solved, worrying will do you no good. So all of us should try to have some mantra in, in our minds each, each time we have. Right? The other mantra which I always keep, <laughs> like which I use as a, as a lojong, as a mind training, is uh, when in the midst of many, check your speech. When alone, check your mind. <laughs> I repeat. When in the midst of many, when you're with many people, always check your speech. But when you're alone, you don't have to check your speech because nobody is going to hear you, but you check your mind. 
Right? And this is from, uh, from Atisha, Atisha Dipankara. Uh, Atisha Dipankara, I think verse 28 from the uh, Bodhisattva Garland of Gems. Right? Bodhisattva Garland of Gems. So it's a beautiful saying, but it's more than a saying. It's something that if we put it in our mind, then before some time, you, you find that it, it, it becomes uh, second nature. It becomes habitual. You know, in the Pali tradition, we use this word anusayas. You heard of the word anusaya? Anusayas means tendencies, right? So how do we cultivate these positive, wholesome tendencies? We do that by constantly reminding ourselves, putting in our mind, so that it stays in the subconscious. All right, like in the midst of many, check my speech. When I'm alone, check my mind. Simple. Right? You don't have to, to remember there are 52 mental, mental factors, which are universal, which are particulars. No need to remember that. You can't. All right? Of course, if you are a great Abhidhamma scholar, that's, that's a different story. Yeah? But ordinary people cannot remember that. So simple, uh, we call it pity sayings. Pity, P-I-T-H-Y. Short sayings. Okay. Okay, so the other one is uncertainty. I, I'm always fascinated by what Steve Jobs, you know who Steve Jobs is? Do you remember who Steve Jobs was? <laughs> right? Those of you who use iPhone, right? you should remember him. You must have gratitude, isn't it? <laughs> gratitude to Steve Jobs. And by the way, Steve Jobs, you know that he, he, when, when he, was, he was alive, he had, a, he had a Zen master. And I think he had a Zen marriage also. When he got married, right? it was a Zen Buddhist ceremony. So he was very much in, into that. This is what I think he, he spoke at his uh, Stanford commencement speech before he passed away. And I find it so Buddhistic. He said, remembering that I'll be dead soon. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure whether he has pre premonition. He said, remembering that I'll be dead soon is the most important tool I've ever encountered to help me make the big choices in life. Because almost everything all external expectations, all pride, all fear of embarrassment or failure. Sounds like the eight woolly conditions, right? Eight vicissitudes in life, right? These things just fall away in the face of death, leaving only what is truly important. So remembering that you are going to die is the best way I know to avoid the trap of thinking you have something to lose. You are already naked. Achancha says the cup is already broken. Steve Jobs said yeah, we are already naked. <laughs> I'm not sure he, whether he, he, he got this idea from Achancha. There's no reason not to follow your heart. Right? So you can read this. You can read his full Stanford commencement speech, which he gave in 2005. But don't you think this is a very Buddhistic speech? Remembering that you're going to die is the best way I know to avoid the trap of thinking you have something to lose. Are we not reminded that every day we should reflect on the five things? The Utu, the, uh, what is the name of that discourse? Five, uh, five things for us to reflect. Upajatana Sutta. Uh, Upajatana Sutta. So in the Upajatana Sutta, it tells us that five things we should constantly remind our, ourselves. We are, what, do you remember? We are, we are born, we will pass away, we are aging, we will go old. All right, those who are near and dear to us will, will, will not be with us. They're subject to illness. And the last one, which is actually directly related to karma, uh, to, to, to equanimity, is we are an heir to our own actions. We, are, we, are, we inherit our own actions. We are an heir to our own actions. Okay? So this is a very important point right? in the Upajatana Sutta. Okay, so it's almost 11, so I just one more slide. So I thought uh, this is important advice about patience, because patience, like Lady Sayadaw in the earlier slide, Lady Sayadaw says for us to practice equanimity, you need a lot of patience in it. All right, so, so I thought his advice, this advice from His Holiness to Dalai Lama is very useful for us. It's also very inspiring. He says spiritual practice is difficult in the beginning, not easy. Do you agree? <laughs> I think it's not easy, right? Who, whoever said it is easy. I don't think anybody says spiritual practice is easy. You wonder how on earth you can ever do it. But as you get used to it, the practice gradually becomes easier. 
Like just now I give you two examples, like the lojong. When you make that as part of your mind stream, so every time something happens, you've got something that can link you back. Then you find that it, you find that it's not that difficult. Yeah, it's not that difficult. Do not be too stubborn. Yeah, or push yourself too hard. What happens if, if you do that? Like in meditation, restlessness and worries will arise, isn't it? <laughs> Remember um, Venerable Ananda, the, 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 the great Ananda. When the Buddha passed away, he was only what a sotapan, right? And he and all the arahans were there. They they reserve a seat for him. Say, hey, look, Ananda, this this for you. But you, in order for you to come, you got to be an arahan. At that time, he was only a sotapan, right? So he tried very hard, very hard. You know, push too hard, push very hard. I must I must be there, because the 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 great the first council is going to start. They reserve a seat for for me. He tried as much as he can, but he couldn't, right? Then he said, oh, enough. Let me take a rest. So what the story says, as he was about to lie down, isn't it? Then <laughs> he attained enlightenment. He attained the, 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 the thing. So because when he was able to relax, and that is, a, now whether that story is literally true or not, I don't know. I mean, nobody knows. But that story has got a lot of, of meaning for all of us that don't push yourself too, too hard. You must know your limits. Yeah, you must know the limit. That is why in the five hindrances, you got sloth and topper and restlessness and worry. So likewise, if you if you're too uh too too chin chai, you know, then then you find that your sloth and topper will, will come in. Right? So you got to have a balance. You have a balance. Okay. So in Solina says the same thing here. Do not be too stubborn or push yourself too hard. If you practice in accord with your individual capacity. Little by little, you will find more pleasure and joy in it. So a very important part in our practice is that we must be happy. We must have joy in our practice. If before coming to Nalanda, you're quite a happy person, but after coming to Nalanda, after six months, you become very gloomy, very sad. You ask yourself, when, when, when am I going to die? You know, <laughs> you know, you know what? Then something is terribly wrong, isn't it? I don't think anything wrong with Nalanda. Right. Okay, I've been coming to, to, to Nalanda for many years now, right? and uh, I feel very happy each time when I come, <laughs> even though past two years, uh, you know, COVID says better stay at home. <laughs> okay, so you should find pleasure, you find joy. So there should be a lot of joy. In, in fact, it is said that, you know, when you engage in Dharma activities, sometimes you, you, uh, you don't get hungry, you know. So my my late teacher used to say, "Oh, that's because you're on, you're having deva food." <laughs> uh, my long haul, you, you used to say at that time when we were we were students at MBMC, you know. Sometimes we we were so engrossed in our the, the discussions with him, and it was already past. Uh, you know, he has of course has his lunch, and we, we have our lunch. So he asks us, oh, "You're not hungry?" We said, "No, no, no. We can still discuss." Then he used to say, "Oh, all of you are already eaten spirit, uh, eaten deva food." <laughs> So as you gain inner strength, your positive actions will gain in profundity and scope. Right? So I think it's a very, uh, very inspiring message for all of us that uh, don't worry. If you think equanimity or is only Buddhas and Arahans can practice it, no. His Holiness says that don't push yourself too hard. Start, start small and then slowly you find it. Okay? So let me end by, um, by emphasis, by which is, all, which is also linked to, the, to our Brahma Viharas. May all sentient beings have happiness and its causes. May all sentient beings be free of suffering and its causes. May all sentient beings always be joyful. And may, sentient, may, may all sentient beings be in equanimity, free of bias, attachment, and anger.